I'm very happy to be here. I have lots of patients who have come to lab over the years and graduated and gone on to bigger and better things, as we say. And we have lots of patients that are coming up through the pipeline. So one of the things we, be t we are going to be talking about tonight is um, what's the relationship between brain and behavior and learning? And often when I train in educational settings as well as medical settings, people are like, well, like, why do you really care? Well, you care all the time because how your brain is configured determines how you behave. And the more you understand about how the brain's configured, then the more you can help and remediate. We're also going to talk a lot about the frontal lobe. So the frontal lobe is a very big part of your brain. And for any of you who have adolescents, it's underdeveloped, which explains why they make impulsive decisions and are very justified then when they say, well, I wasn't really thinking about that because it's not online yet. Um, and then what are the factors that are really going to be helpful in making your children reach their op optimal outcome? So our goal um, whenever we see kids is to push for an understanding of the biology and then looking for outcome and how they relate. So the etiology really does help us understand treatment and outcomes. So if you have an absent corpus callosum, which is a major structure in your brain that communicates right and left hemispheres, then it makes a lot of sense that you're having trouble transferring information, that you're going to struggle with anything that's midline. Um, and we also know that the earlier you access this information, the brain is wonderfully plastic. It changes really nicely, and it actually changes for the rest of our lives, contrary to what people think. There's a great guy at University um, San Francisco, M Michael Mersnich, who's now proved that people over 70s will have their brains changed if you give them specific targeted treatment. So it is never time to say too late. It's just that earlier is easier because the brain's more malleable, along with everything. Um, and then the more you understand, the less fearful the future is for the kids and for you and for the school. And what, one of the things we say to our families is you want to be empowered, right? You want to know as much as you possibly can because information gives you power and gives you insight. And science changes so fast that what we knew five years ago is really out of date. So when we look at the frontal lobe, this is a big, major portion of your brain. It is what is here. This is why 20 years ago when I was coaching my daughter in soccer, I was like, headers are a bad idea. Like the best part of your brain, we're knocking against a soccer ball. Years later, that has come to be true. Um, and there were many of us at Children's who were worried about headers. But we call it the governor because it is what controls and really organizes your output, your behavior. It has a huge impact on your regulatory function. So road rage is related to frontal dysfunction. Um, the person who breaks out, you know, my ongoing joke is there are movie stars that you can think of who are often arrested for anger management issues. So you'd wonder about their frontal function. Um, it's multimodality. In other words, it's taking information in from sensory, from tactile, from vestibular, from smell, and then making sense of it so you can use it. It has a profound effect on your personality. So the passive kiddo is telling you something about his frontal lobe function, just like the hyperactive child. And we're going to talk about disorders at the end that actually have different characteristics based on frontal function. So when we think about the frontal lobe, one of the good news things is it begins prenatally and it evolves well into the fourth decade of life. The majority of the growth is by 25 and 26, and it comes in sort of fits and spurts. So one of the big growth areas, uh, eras is between four and six. So I talk to school districts all over the country and say, really nobody should go into kindergarten before six because then that piece of that timing will have reached its optimal. And the reason that's beneficial is it's really helpful for the kids. We also think about that a lot of the growth occurs um, up until 16 to 25 years of age. Girls are always first and grow faster, which is one of the reasons we talk about girls and their difference in personalities is because of this frontal lobe having a very pervasive effect. Boys come on later 
And that also is why they need much more surveillance and protection um, because their lack of judgment, they're not thinking about dying. And the more important piece of that is we've talked about that for years and years. They're not even anticipating the problems that may not be related to dying, but all the other things that could surround it, the, what we call the collateral damage. You could have a car accident, you could be permanently changed. So one of the things I write about is brain differences explain and result in different behavioral symptoms, and these are impactful in both neurocognitive and learning disorders. So we always want to know more about how brain function is impacting your child because that then helps us develop treatment plans that are more appropriate, more impactful, bigger changes. So if you think about the substructures, and we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but this gives you an idea of how complex it is. Prefrontal cortex has to plan the movement. So instantly my brain is saying lifting hand. In a nanosecond, the prep is coming for the movement, and then finally it executes it. So when do you see this breakdown? Any of the adults in this room, we could show frontal dysfunction. If we gave you something new that you hadn't done before, and was taxing from a planning standpoint. So one of the easy examples is, if you've never been on skis and we put you on skis, you know exactly what the ski instructor is saying. You're gonna do pizza, you're gonna do parallel, but your feet don't go there. Your brain knows it, but you can't execute the movement. So that's what kids who are growing their brains are doing all the time. They have three places they can break down, three places to get it wrong, three places to not integrate it. Temporal lobe is important because in language-based learning, children with language-based learning difficulties, it affects both how they process auditory information, how they use their speech and language, how they read, all of that is tied into the temporal lobe. What's equally important is temporal lobe and frontal lobe have a lot in communication because our ability to talk comes from the temporal lobe, our ability to output comes from the frontal lobe. Parietal lobe is the part of your brain that really works on movement and perception. So now, I don't know how many people heard the noise outside, but there's noise outside and in the back of my mind, well, I'm registering that and ignoring it. And that's helpful. If I couldn't ignore it, I would be the child in the classroom who's like, did you hear that noise? I just heard that noise. Where's that noise? What do you think's going on with that noise? And that's very consistent. So this tells us a lot about how the kids sort their information. And most important, I think, on frontal lobe is the ability to develop self-control and focus is ever growing. So if you look back on parents who had kids who were wild little Indians in elementary school, middle school, often parents will tell you, you know, it's so funny, around 23, 24, 25, it's like brain just seemed to turn on, he got it. There's big growth in the frontal function. And Jay Geed, who's now used to be at the NIH and as a collaborator of mine is at University of California, San Diego, used to say, I think the car rentals got it right. Can't rent till you're 25. Because there's a lot of judgment that comes in the part of time that we're not always thinking about, college and early independence, getting your first job. So the other thing that we worry about in frontal lobe dysfunction is working memory. Can you plan what needs to be done to get you somewhere? Can you get your keys? It's raining out, you bring an umbrella. Oh wait, you know, the weather says it's gonna be cold, maybe I should think about, do I really wanna be traveling at dusk because the roads could freeze? That's all the working memory coming together. Inhibition is what comes with time. So you may meet somebody who is amazingly annoying to you, but you will not say anything. It also is one of the first things that disintegrates with time. So we think about the patient in the nursing home who says to whoever comes in, that's a really ugly dress. And you're like, hmm, that's the inhibition at the other end. So it is very cyclical. So when we're talking about ADHD and brain, one of the things we know is there's decreased gray matter density and that also means there's cortical differences. So kids with ADHD are gonna come online later. Time is your friend with them because growth and development comes over time. So the exasperating 16-year-old could very well be a much more mature, organized adult at 26. 
but you have to remember that it's 16 and you got to keep them alive to get them there because in between there's a lot of time to get into trouble. We also know that ADHD, there's a lot of circuitry that is both under activated, so they're not processing information and can also be overactivated. And any parent of an ADHD child will tell you, you didn't hear a word I said until I said, hey, do you want to go out and play video games? And they're like, what, what? You know, because now that part of the circuitry, highly valued, frontal has come to full alert and is like, pay attention because it's important. So the key in school is to get to the important part more often than not, because that helps the child stay on. One of the things we do, I was at genetics at Children's for 18 years and ran a developmental division. And one of the things the chairman used to say all the time was, look, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Get a family history. It's very important how you learned, how your spouse learned, even how the siblings learn, because that will often translate into the little person you're seeing. Equally important is a history of anxiety, because now we have genetic disorders that are coming up as what we call copy number variants, where there's a history of anxiety, and that's the only clue we have that then leads us to a name and an explanation for the child. So I tell people, when you're getting evaluations, try not to hold back. You know, we always say, we have like standard funny questions we ask because that's often the pearl. Anybody in your family that everybody thinks a little odd, eccentric? Oh yeah, you know, I got that uncle who will only do blah, blah, blah. And you say, oh, and so what side of the family is on? Well, it's on my mom's side, okay? Oh, she has a brother too that does blah, blah, blah. And as you look, you find connections. And though dyslexia is not a dominant that's transferred from parent to child, the more dyslexic in a family, the higher the risk is your child's gonna have dyslexia. So there is a genetic component, we just don't quite understand how. When we think of learning disorders, one of the things I think that's often overlooked is it's both verbal and nonverbal information. So you can be a very smart learning disabled child but have an impact that is atypical in the nonverbal domain. Or you can be a language-based child, language-based learning dysfunction, who often has an impairment in nonverbal. That's important for the school because they will be pushing everything non-verbally in pictures, and maybe that's not the child's dominant area. So epigenetics is the new thing, the new kid on the block in genetics, and it affects learning in that there are changes in your human genome by, to your genes and how they are extra, expressed by stress, by illness, by exposure. So that becomes really important. So we think about kids who have been exposed to violence when they were two or three, and everybody assumed maybe they didn't see it, they didn't understand it. We actually give that much more thought now because we don't know that for sure. So when, we, when kids come see us and you know, they're struggling in school, what are we looking for? So the way I was trained both, up, both at Boston Children's and down at GW and Children's National is, I never look for what everybody tells me they think they have. So at least once a week, somebody walks in and says, you know, I really think he has autism. I'm like, that's great, we're gonna park that over here and I'm gonna go to great lengths to look at all the things that it could be because it's very easy to be predisposed to a diagnosis because somebody suggested it. I also never look at school records till after we're done testing because I wanna see one, if I caught what they caught and two, what did I catch that nobody else saw? because that's really valuable. We spend a lot of time working with pediatricians, geneticists, and neurologists around the world getting at the causation. Like, what's going on? Like, can we go look for copy number variants? Are there extra chromosomes? Are there insufficient chromosomes? Because that's gonna help us, and that's gonna lead us to a body of knowledge to help us understand the learning disorder. And you can't, you know, I was on the phone today with the school system, and. Sort of the bane of my life is when you're talking to a school program, public school program, and trying to get them to understand the genetic disorder, and they're like, but we're really individualized. We're very individualized, but it would be nonsense not to know about the genetic disorder, because if 85% of the kids have this, we want to make sure he does have it or he doesn't have it. That's just in your best interest. 
Um, so we're always looking at genetics, family, and child. We're also looking at how the child does in the best circumstances, right? Our office is configured in our testing in an optimal way. There's treasure chests, there's a candy drawer. Not that I'm pro sugar, but it's highly rewarding, highly motivating for little guys and gals. We build everything in to bring them up to optimal function. And Barry Brazelton did a great job when we were training at children saying, look, you want to know the best? Because everybody knows the worst. That's the easy one to find. The hard one to find is what's the best the child can do. And then we're always trying to tease out, like, why do some kids have tons of things go wrong and they still do great? And other kids have minor things go wrong and they struggle. So this idea of resilience. Some kids can have tons of roadblocks and they will be able to go around them, over them, and under them. Others, not so much. And then our last piece is to factor the learning disorder into that. That's really valuable because maybe the learning disorder isn't the problem. Maybe it's the resilience. Maybe the child's given up. You know, we had a, um, years ago, it was about 10 years ago now, I had a kiddo come in from Montana who had 140 nonverbal IQ and 100 verbal IQ. So it was an easy one. He had language-based learning difficulty. We had a genetic explanation for it. But the bigger problem was he was 100% convinced he was stupid. And it didn't matter. He had really been really browbeaten down in his school setting. And we spent a long time to, to try to get the message apart, you know, imparted to him. It was that was the really the nut that was making it difficult for recovery. Because until we got him on board that he had the capacity, it wouldn't matter how ideal the program was. So that's often the hardest part, is figuring out what piece is missing. When we talk about environment, we talk about your home environment, we talk about school, but we also talk about peer environment. Do you have kids that make you feel good? Do you have kids who tell you every day you're dumb? That's really difficult. Do you have kids that you can go to when you've had a hard day with your teacher that you wouldn't tell your mom or dad, but you have a best friend who says, yeah, I know, I hate her too. Some days she's really hard because the peer-to-peer -peer interaction becomes more and more powerful as children mature. So kinds of learning differences, you know language-based learning disorders, many of the children at lab have this. Many children have executive dysfunction. ADHD has multiple categories, but the idea that the attentional pathway is atypical. And then anxiety. And anxiety is the new kid, so to speak, on the block. It's often talked about. I know Bonnie Zucker was here a couple weeks ago, who's a colleague of ours. And I think anxiety is so much more impactful than any of us ever thought or wanted to think. And kids are very good about keeping their anxiety discreet. They are very good about keeping a lid on it. Where you then see it come out is when they explode for no reason. You know, the classic. They're watching TV and a commercial came in and they're having a screaming fit over the commercial and you're like, doesn't make any sense. That's the pot that boiled over. So we look a lot into anxiety and we spend a lot of time um, playing, role playing with kids, things that make us anxious versus them. And any adult who's, you know, I say to the kids, anxious, sure, we can talk about it every day. There's a good reason to be anxious. Let's think about what, are you, what were you worried about today? I can tell you what I was worried about. One of the most common disorders um, is language-based learning difficulties, and it comes in many faces and facets. So one of the things that we work very hard to explain to people is you have dyslexia, that's a reading disorder, but you could also have a motor planning deficit that came through as delayed speech as a three to five year old. And that motor planning undergirding is important both for treatment and recovery and how and what kind of treatment you get. Developmental dyspraxia is the child who trips across the room, but there's no bump in the rug. Parents come in and say that all the time. You know, he trips and there's nothing on the floor, and you're like, right, he forgot that his feet were in front of him. Or they lost, he lost track of what he was doing. And then last, developmental dysgraphia. The reason this is becoming more and more important, we've always known there's an ocular motor dysfunction in dyslexia that kids have trouble with visual convergence and smooth movements across um, the reading. But what we didn't know is one, it's very identifiable by three to five years of age. Two, there's a variety of treatments now, and there's also a variety of tech 
things like different fonts, different colors, different sizes that can accommodate to this ocular motor dysfunction, which then improves writing and improves comprehension. So many kids with dyslexia are reading and reading and reading and reading and reading. So they're not crossing completely. They're reading a part of the line, dropping down, reading a part of the line, dropping down, reading again. So now they've had a part of four lines, but comprehension's affected. And one of the kids, you know, sometimes the kids give us the best studies. One of the kids said to me one day, you know, I'd be a really good reader if I could like only get my eyes to stay on the line. And I was like, really? And he was like, yeah, like they're all over the place. Your eyes all over the place. And I was like, sometimes my eyes are all over the place. That's very valuable in little ones. And for older ones, it's very important for college boards, SATs and ACTs. So behavioral symptoms, you get lower self-confidence poor self-concept, and our responsibility, and you can say this, and all of us who are parents know, you know, let's face it, we all take the guilt on for whatever happens to our kids. Women do this often more than men, but the idea of, oh my God, what did I do wrong? Your biggest job is to tell them and to encourage them that this too will pass, and you will be good, and you will get there. Because in most kids' cases, that is really true. Um, and especially kids that are in schools like lab, because they have the capacity, they're just waiting for both the brain and the treatment to congeal and be supportive. So when you think of executive function, if you have a kiddo who's disorganized, we want him to take responsibility, but look how many steps he has. He has to plan it, he has to organize it, he also has to develop the plan if something goes wrong. Then he's got to evaluate the action. Does he want to do it now? Does he want to do it in five minutes? You got to be the, so to speak, administrative assistant that picks how many pieces of that he's going to do and how many pieces you're going to do. So if he's gotten his homework all done, getting him to put it in the backpack is worth your time and money because then the next piece will be to get it out of the backpack. So if you can get it in the backpack, that saves a lot of time with the battles because you want it out. Or like we say in some kids' cases, it's not about getting it out of the backpack, it's about not wanting to really engage with the teacher. The teacher asks, they'd be okay, but the idea of handing it in sometimes for kids is really hard. So you pick what piece of the puzzle is most valuable and you build from there. And eventually it will all come with lots of practice, but it has to go very sequentially, very hierarchically, and very patiently because it's easy to forget along the way. So talking about anxiety, this is important. Anxiety has three parts. It has body, behavior, and thoughts. So and all, anybody who's had anxiety knows this. My, my head hurts, I'm so anxious. My stomach hurts, my hands are sweaty. Okay, behavior is you gotta push the kid next to you in line because you really don't wanna get to the front of the line because then you're gonna have to tell the teacher you forgot your homework. Um, so that results in behavior. And then thoughts are, oh my God, the teacher hates me. She must think I'm stupid. Because doesn't everybody think I'm stupid? All of those have to be attacked for anxiety to be manageable. So one of the things we know, it's very common in children, adolescents, and adults. It's got a very strong genetic component. Anxious mothers and fathers often have anxious kids. And there's two pieces to the anxiety. One is the genetic piece, but the other is, if you're worrying as a parent, the kiddo picks up on it. So we had a mom in the other day whose child was very anxious and she was in risk management. <laughs> and she, she said to me, like, I know, like, the world's really dangerous. I worry about it all the time. That's what I do all day. And I go, yeah, but, like, I don't worry about, like, I'm not worried about losing my leg today. It's, like, not on my radar. She goes, but I can tell you how much it costs. It was a very funny conversation. Her anxiety to her kid was a direct line. She was, like, every time she fell, I thought about her getting a concussion. And I was, like, right, but kids fall. Right? So at some point, you have to rein in your own anxiety if that's your issue. We know it's somewhere between 6 to 18%. Some people will tell you it's more than that. Um, it's certainly not less. And many children have both stress and stress-related physical symptoms. I have a headache. We had one kiddo who always had a sore toe. I, I never, we never figured out what the, why the toe. But when things weren't right, the toe was bad. 
And it was a, you know, and the mother would be for a long time before we sort of put it all together. She was like, you know how many times I've been to the doctor with a stupid toe? Is it infected? Did he bump it? Is it broken? He's had an extra. And then it was like, it's, the toe is the symptom. So when the toe is in pain, the kid is in pain. You want to know what your kid's triggers and what their tells are. So, you know, I used to say with my one kiddo, <laughs> They would get in the car when you pick them up at the line and how the door slammed, I knew how school went. There'd be some days the door would slam and I'd be like, oh, it's gonna be such a long ride. Um, because that told me, and other days the door would be, you know, would just close and you'd be like, ah, good day. There the, the tells are very valuable. So we have internalizers versus externalizers. Girls tend to be more internal. They have a propensity for anxiety, both physical and um, emotional. They turn their stress, so they have stomach aches, they have headaches, they overeat, they underate. Boys tend to be more characteristic externalizers. Boys, when they get upset, like to have a motor action. They throw, they kick, they slam. All of that's valuable because you can take a really stressed seven-year-old and put him outside with a soccer ball and let him beat the soccer ball to death. He can kick it for an hour and feel great, which then gives him a mechanism to relax. Um, you know, we used to have one kid, we, <laughs> we hung a punching bag in his basement um, because when he would have a really bad day, he was like slugging everybody in the house, all the kiddos. And so we're like, do the punching bag. You can just punch the punching bag. And the mother would be like, he's down there for hours. I'm like, as long as it's the bag, we're in good shape. We'll deal with the, the story will come out, but at least we'll get the motor action under control. It's much harder to find internalizers. They are well behaved. They are quiet. They are often very good in class. And so we worry most about girls, but there are boys that are like this as well. So, you know, the symptoms, sweaty palms, fast heartbeat, tense muscles, stomach aches. Some kids will actually get physically ill. They can spike a temperature because they're so stressed. The worries, these are the thoughts you've all heard. What if I fail my test? It's okay. You know, tomorrow's another day. The year's not going to end. You know, in college, it's like, what if I fail the grade, the course? Summer school's always an option. You know, the reality is most things are manageable. Um, thinking errors, my teacher will hate me because I did such and such. Most teachers go into these fields because they love kids and it takes a long time to get them to hate a particular child. Um, and then I must be stupid is of course a garden variety that everybody has heard. And my standard line to the kids is, you know if you were stupid you probably wouldn't be saying it. Typically, very impaired kids don't come up to you and say, I'm stupid. So the fact that you have insight that you think you're stupid is telling me now you're probably not stupid, but you feel stupid. And so let's talk about what stupid feels like. You failed the test. Well, you're learning. Failing is okay as long as you learn. It's when it's worrisome when you don't learn. So we have kids who are avoidant. I'm not doing my homework till 10 o'clock at night because then I don't have to worry about how bad I did it because I was really tired. It's not my fault it wasn't good. Nervous behaviors, reassurance seeking, mom, 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 dad, dad. They're just continually doing a loop. Asking repeated questions. I was FaceTiming with one of our little patients who's having a very difficult time. He said to me, it was very sweet, and he had had a very hard day. He said, do you ever get so mad you just don't want to come home? And I said, no, actually, coming home is sort of nice. It's like my cave. He was, well, that's because nobody lives with you. And I said, this is true. Um, I said, but in your case, you can go in your cave. You can go in your room and not talk to your mom and dad. And he was like, but, and I knew exactly what he was going to say. He said, my dad always asks. So sometimes saying nothing is really valuable. Silence is very helpful. Kids often will talk when they're ready. And the what you do, what, how do you feel can be overwhelming. As much as we want to, sometimes you have to bite your tongue, hand, go for a walk until they're ready to come to you. Tantrums and clinging, and checking and scanning the environment. This is a thing we see in the little kids, where they'll come in and their eyes are flying around the room. They're like waiting for somebody, or they're at the door so they can see everybody in front of them. They're worried. You know, they go to the birthday party and they're on the perimeter. And that's not a bad place, and all you have to do is say, well, what else can you do to make yourself more comfortable? 
can you step in and foot? Maybe you can find a friend to talk to who's across the room only for a minute, and then you can go back to where it's the safe zone. So you're always looking for be brave, try, try to win successfully, and it's okay to then sort of recede back in and regroup. Our little kids, pre-K to second graders, separation anxiety, you know, the classic, the kiddo who's hanging on their mother's leg um, at drop-off, won't get out of the car. Sleep anxiety is a very big one. The kid who can't fall asleep, can't stay asleep, wakes up at 4 o'clock in the morning because now he's worried. And then transitions, new teacher, new school year, new school, new bus driver. There's so many things to worry about if you're little and you're anxious. And one of the things we use, and Bonnie and I talk about this all the time, is kids forget how much they've accomplished. So you say, remember, like you don't remember in third grade, you didn't even want to go in the classroom. You were afraid, but then you made all these friends. Now in kindergarten, you walk down the hallway. Now you're in middle school, you walk all over the school. Sort of revisiting success is very therapeutically rewarding for kids, even for adults, um, but very much for kids because out of their memory very quickly. So it can be harder for younger children or critical time parts in your life transitions. Middle school is a huge transition. High school is. But the one that no, we often forget is when kids go off to college. To leave you to go to college, they have to hate where they are. This is a very well-known fact in child psychiatry. And of course, by the time they're ready to go to college, most parents will agree that everybody's in the same state of hate. You know, like, hmm, I'm gonna really miss you. I love you so much. Wait, are you leaving? Because they've got, this is the biggest separation of their entire life, right? They're never gonna have a greater separation than to go to college without your, your help, right? You're not gonna be there. You're not gonna help them with their homework. They have to make all new friends. So high school gets very challenging, end of junior year and all of senior year, because the anxiety is preying on them. So you wanna empathize. You don't necessarily wanna discipline when kids are misbehaving and it's anxious driven. You wanna sort of sit back and let the dust settle and see if you can get to the root of it. You always wanna think about controlled choices. I don't want to do any of my homework. I hate my homework. I hate my teacher. You just don't understand how awful fifth grade is. OK, I get fifth grade's hard. Let's think about, do we want to do math or reading? I don't want to do anything. OK, well, I think I'm going to open the book for reading just to see what's there. Sometimes taking the first step, they will follow very nicely behind you. Um, fostering creativity where the kids can really explore. Lab does a great job of this. This is theater. This is music. This is art. You know, and some of our most talented people are kids and young adults who have had learning issues. They're great in photography and artwork. And that's because that part of their brain is very preserved. And then you want to, and this is always hard, you want to support their natural interests, even though they're, they may be very counterproductive to yours. And you don't think about this, but you know, I am always say my kids taught me a lot, but my one kid I wanted to bring a snake. If there's anything I'm afraid of, you know, Indiana Jones and me, I hate snakes. And so I was like, snakes, I can't have a snake in the house. Like I was like totally preoccupied. So the deal was how were we gonna get something snake-like, but not actually a snake, so that I could sleep and not worry about the snake getting out. Um, and so we settled on a bearded dragon which I came to sort of cherish in a very weird way because it was good enough and she was happy. It was sort of prehistoric looking. Um, and that was sort of the compromise. But it's very important to follow their thread. And that was probably one of my greatest challenges. And I, like, I still laugh about it because she'd be like, I'm going to get a snake. She lives on her own now and it's very well launched. I was like, that's good as long as it's at your house. I'm happy. So separation anxiety. Separation anxiety is normal for all kids throughout their lives at different junctures. So it's reasonable that kids are worried at college, but it's not reasonable that your child is so worried about going to college he can't go to college. So some kids will come home 10 times between September and December in college because that's their comfort level. Some kids leave and never come back until Thanksgiving. That's all in what you're trying to sort through what's reasonable. Um, you want a healthy bond with your child, but you also want to acknowledge the fears. And everybody's got a fear. 
You know, there isn't anybody who's not afraid of something. And if they are, they're really delusional because it's just nature of the human being to be frightened of something. And so your kids really value what you are frightened of. And what kids love the most is to hear the stories of your screw ups. Right? That they, they, they perceive us for a very long time that we got everything right and it was easy. And so it's helpful for them to hear about in third grade, I had a teacher who did blah, blah. Um, the other thing that happens between third grade to eighth grade, and this is important, hormones are a very big part of development now and kids are developing earlier, precociously even. And so starting in third grade, hormones can be affecting your girl as well as your boy. And that then changes how they interact with their peers and the idea of social power, the perfect kiddo. You know, there's always somebody perfect in every classroom. And they, they look similar in that there's something about them that gives the aura that they got it under control, even though as adults, you know, that's not true. Then they worry about school performance starting and sometimes by the end of second grade, but for sure by third. So we can tell our kindergartners it's a game. Hey, look, we're gonna play a game. You know, you're gonna fill out all these they're like, oh, okay, you say to the third grader that, and they're going, tell me how many I got right. So they've now figured it out. So then you have to adjust to, well, we're not worried about how many you got right. I'm actually worried about what you got wrong so we can fix it. And so we talk that through. The other thing that happens today, the social power that kids have, both from social media as well as all the things that go. And there are many websites to go to that teach you how to monitor your children, how to follow Snapchat and everything else, which if you don't have access to, we could certainly get them for you. But I, I can't tell you enough how much monitoring is important. And you all know that probably more than any of us think about because when your kids get old enough, they always tell you the things you didn't know they did. And so the idea is you're trying to be one step ahead as much as possible. And you wanna have confidence in friendships. So, you want them to have friends, but you want them to have the right kind of friends. So that becomes judgment in how you facilitate it and foster it. And that's important. And the reason is, you know, sometimes girls can be incredibly mean about other girls, but boys can do the same thing. They're just more subtle. Who's the klutzy kid? He can't kick the soccer ball. Did you ever see that kid on the basketball court? He's got 10 left feet. That same kind of um, sort of one-upping. So when we look at test anxiety, one of the things we know from the brain is it likes practice. Repetition is your friend. So the more you practice tests, the better the brain gets because then it starts to think automatically. This is why when you drive a lot, you're not stressed by driving. When you're a 16 year old, you're exhausted in the beginning because you're putting so much energy. So we practice tests and then we practice timed and untimed. The reason we do timed is we're gonna have all the tests untimed, but it's really fun for the kids to beat their own time. Oh my God, look, I did that in a minute. This time I did it in 55 seconds. That's very helpful for them. And then we want them to have a good work eth ethic, and most of all, we want them to understand learning is the goal. Okay, grades are important, but it's about learning, because you're gonna learn for the rest of your life. And though every kiddo in the world seems to know that Bill Gates left Harvard, and became a millionaire. And Zuckerberg did the same thing, but there were 5,000 other people behind them or not, maybe 50,000 who didn't. So it's a tried and true, it's the work and the repetition. And you wanna really define your child's success and what fits with your family and your community. So it's not only about grades, it's not only about the best schools, maybe not only be about being the best of anything, it's about how do you feel, how good are you, and where are you thinking? So, you know, the, uh, we had a youngster, he actually was here in lab for a while, and then he left and went to another school, and the dad said to me, I'd known him since he was in our hospital at Children's, he's gone to college. I said, okay, and, he, and this was when he was like three months old. Um, and so I was like, sure, college is good. I'm not worried about college. I'm like worried about getting him through his cardiac surgery, <laughs> not having him arrest. Like that, let's sort of prioritize timing-wise. He was, every year I saw him, he worried about college. At 18, he wasn't ready for college, and the dad said, that's okay, he's coming to my office. I was like, good deal. He had him at his office, he worked as an office assistant, and every day at his office, he had him read for two hours. He didn't care what he read, and they would talk about it. 
So he went on to college at 20 and finished. And the important piece to that is nobody asks you how old you were when you get done. They just asked if you got done. And so the father really, the father and mother brought this to be, but they came in the kiddo's timing. So the timing was not what would have been traditional, but it worked out fine. And from the father's perspective and the mother's, he had, he had the bullet, he knew where he was going, and he was okay with time, and the kiddo didn't care because he was happy being with his dad for the two years. So when we think about ADHD, though, it does seem like everybody in the world has ADHD and everybody's on meds. It's actually 8 to 10% of the population. Um, depending on which studies, there's three types, inattentive, hyperactive, and combined. Most common is inattentive. We typically don't, often that is not brought to one's attention because the kids are quiet and not getting in trouble. It's the kiddo who seems to be forgetful who seems to not get through the entire test. That is the beginning of inattentive. And girls and boys are equally distributed in inattentive, and, but boys tend to be more hyperactive. Girls that are hyperactive are the combined type. We think of them as the girl who talks nonstop in school. That may be true with boys, but it's very characteristic with girls. They early on are flagged by first grade that they're always talking regardless of who else is talking. They can be both, um, both anxiety and ADHD can be over and under diagnosed. The DSM-5 criteria is challenging because it's very black and white. So you can have a child who has ADHD but doesn't meet criteria but will benefit from medication and that's always the skill of the examiner. You can have kids who will meet criteria but not benefit from medication because there's something else driving it. So it takes a lot of thought to tease out, is it real ADHD? Do we want to go the medication route? What else is going on to confound it? We say boys are twice as likely. There's a lot of data starting to suggest that girls are markedly underdiagnosed. It's still sort of up for grabs in the literature. Anxious kids can be hyperactive and distracted, so anxiety is often easier to rule out than ADHD because there's a lots of questionnaires that open conversations with kids. Executive dysfunction can look like ADHD. You're forgetting everything, you're getting lost, you're not turning your homework in. Executive function, dysfunction responds very well to a coach, an executive function coach, and then that sort of peels off the layers of the ADHD. So the inattentive type is exactly what you would expect. Easily distracted, they seem not to be listening when you're talking. They can be daydreamers, the classic kiddo who says, oh yeah, I never heard the teacher say that. Oh no, the teacher said it like three times in the class. Oh no, but I, I no, no, she didn't say it. And then the teacher, of course, has documented it. They are often more quiet or shy and sort of into themselves a little bit more reclusive. And they are often forgetful or lose things. You know, so it's the kid who's lost his hat, you know, before the cold weather has come in. Um, the hyperactive kids, we all know, they are the restless kid. It's the foot that's moving, the hand that's tapping on the desk. Um, they tend to be more easily frustrated and can be aggressive. They're not all aggressive. Sometimes they are the kid who drops the book on the floor five times because he wants to get out of his chair so he can pick up his book. The other thing that little boys do in elementary school when they're hyperactive is they always have to go to the bathroom. They get a walk. I'm going to go down the hallway. I'm going to walk for a little bit. I'm going to stroll back. So they're getting a break. Um, that becomes less and less advantageous, obviously, because they're losing more and more school. And the combined type has a little bit of both and impulsivity. So one of the things we always worry about is kids with ADHD can have peer-to-peer -peer challenges say things they shouldn't say, jump in when they're not invited. Um, they can also have, be very passive and getting taken advantage of. So they want their friends so much that they're willing to do anything to keep their friend. And that's always more worrisome to me. The hyperactive child, everybody knows. The passive kid can easily get lost. We had a little boy in our office not very long ago who when I said, what's going on? You know, you're being really aggressive. He's like, nothing. He was nine. Um, I said, oh, okay, I don't know. You know, I thought something might be going on. He, I said, how's the bus? Bus is a great place for bad things to happen. He was, I hate the bus. 
I said, why do you hate the bus? He goes, somebody's always picking on me. And then everything unraveled. And the mother was like, he's had three detentions for the bus. I go, yes, because he finally socked whoever was picking on him or poking him or jabbing him. So they were both wrong. It's not to blame the other child. But often what happens is that the kid who acts out gets punished, but nobody goes back and looks at the cost. It's a very big issue. So what are we looking for? Here at lab, you don't have to worry about this, but for ACTs and SATs, we talk about extended time for test taking. We have a variety of creative ways we've done that. We have some kids taking SATs and ACTs in one hour segments because they get physically tired, their brain. They'll be like, I'm just working so hard, I can't think anymore. And you go, okay. We have, we can put them on computers for the testing. We can give them computer reading games. We can give them audio books. There's lots of ways to bypass all the problems. We can change the font, we can change the color, we can put more white space. There's a hundred ways now to, to alter what goes on in ACTs and SATs. But the key is you gotta have documentation and you gotta be ahead of the game because the board is friendly but they know that people are going to be gaming the system. So you have to be very, you have to be very honest and you have to document systematically. We talked about childhood apraxia of speech. This is this soft motor planning problem. This is very different than traditional speech. It's motor-based. It's important to sort out. Is your cluttered speech, your inarticulation, your lack of clarity, what's the cause of that? The dysgraphia, when we think about long-term, you can start with occupational therapy, you can get note-takers, you can go on computers. Dysgraphia is almost a non-issue now because how much we're all dependent on computers. It's totally changed, and that's a good thing. For executive dysfunction, there's lots of different ways, but one of the things we always talk about, you want to give them lots of breaks because they tire. It's a lot of work to pay attention and to plan. So we don't think about it because as adults, you're planning all the time. You're doing it on the fly. You know, I may say to people, I'm on talking on my phone as I'm driving to go to a meeting, telling somebody about what I'm going to do after the meeting so that they get it ready for the next meeting. Well, that's because it's second nature to me. But if you're a kiddo who's just growing your brain, that's really hard to figure out what needs to happen 20 minutes from now because they're living right in the moment. Anxiety, we talk about this deep breathing, take a walk, um, meditation, yoga, these are all helpful things for kids. Movement is your friend for anxious kids. The more you move, the less anxious you are. It is reality. Did you ever go in an airport and watch people pace when their plane's late? This is what's going on, right? What are they going to do? They get nowhere to go. And you'll watch you know, lots of people. Now we have people reading, but we have lots of people who are walking up and down the airport. I happen to be one of them because I'm buggy, right? I'm like, on go, I want to go. Sitting back makes me anxious. For kids, movement is what their brain craves. The more they move, the better their brain. Tons of studies showing that. You want to teach them to fact check negative thoughts. I'm going to die because I got a D. Well, you're probably not going to die. The D, what can we do? Um, thinking or teacher hates me. Everybody in the class did great except for me. Mm, I don't think so. Okay, how do we find that out? Um, recognizing the worry and then beating the worry. So um, Bonnie and I were talking about, well, she wrote a great book and if you haven't seen it, I know she was here a couple weeks ago, Raising Anxiety Free Kids is a Bible for our patients. But I, used, I said to her before she wrote her book, the idea that I loved is I would say to kids, you know, when I get nervous, I get those butterflies in my tummy. And one of the kids said, I have buffaloes. And I was like, wow, you're like really worried. And he was like, and there's a herd. <laughs> and I was like, you yeah, have days like that too, buddy. And so the idea is what are we going to do with those buffaloes? We're going to put them under control. We're going to send them back to the barn. So conquering worry is a feeling of empowerment. This was hard and you did it. We had a little boy in our office the other day who gave the entire office a run for our money. Four and a half, debilitated seven to five adults. And the big thing was he was standing in my hallway and he had a car. And I was standing 10 feet away that he wanted to show me. 
But I didn't want to move because I wanted them to walk down the hallway to come show it to me because there were other people. So I was like, hey, you got to be brave. You got to come down and show me your car. And he was like, back and forth, no, yes, no. I go, well, I'm okay, I'm gonna stay here. Slowly, these two little feet got him moving, and he came, and then I was like, and I'm always upping the ante with the kids, I was like, you could show Selena the car. And she was like five, maybe three feet away, and he went, and then tore down the other way, and ran out. But he was really brave, so we're like, wow, well, aren't you brave? You came to me, you showed Selena the car, you'd be worry. So the idea is it's conquerable. It is something under your control and you can make it manageable. And Bonnie always says you can make worry disappear um, with the idea that it's yours to beat versus worry controls you. So the other thing that sh we all talk about is what are triggers for kids. My mom leaving me, my mom and dad are going out. Suppose they're gonna have an accident. They're taking a plane, I'm not on the plane. Suppose it crashes. All of that is something that can be replaced with reality. And one of the things we have to be mindful of, in most cases, that's true. So you can't say all, right? Because anybody can have a car crash. Most planes don't crash. Majority of planes don't crash, but some do. So you're saying to them, in the majority, this is likely, because you have to balance the reality. So we want them to face their fears. We want them to learn to habituate to what's challenging. And, you know, we talk about getting into a cold pool. You know how you get in little by little? Same idea. You stage and go hierarchically if you're frightened of something. So you're frightened to come down the hallway. Okay, but you're frightened more to talk to adults. So you'll come down the hallway to talk to me, and now you can show the adult the car. So you're building up their ability to control their own anxiety. You are literally desensitizing what sets them off. We had, I had an RA several years ago who could not take an exam without a beta blocker because he was so anxious and he wanted to be a doctor. And I was like, the only problem with that is like, you can't take a beta blocker when you're in the ER. Like you're, <laughs> you're gonna do an ER rotation. You have to get your anxiety under control because you aren't gonna be able to care for patients until you figure out a way to manage the stress of all that's there. It was very, very challenging for him, and his, his original design was to take medicine, which can be good in isolated circumstances, but to go into medicine, to take medicine, it's like you're gonna be on beta blockers for 36 hours when you're on call. What's gonna happen then? So that's, again, worry actually had control. He didn't manage his own worry. So you, you and it takes a lot of work. If you have kids who are bad sleepers, and I give full transparency when I give talks. I had my kids in, the, in sleeping with me because I was so tired until they were like eight years old because I was just too tired in the middle of the night to get up and walk them back to their room and I just like acquiesced. I was like, sure, come on in. It's a big bed. But if you want to make a sleep plan, then you have to acknowledge that you're going to have four to seven nights of living hell while you battle it out. And, or you can do like they do in Europe, which is they leave your bed when they get older. They just get up and go. And it was like, you know, this is a phase that we're all gonna enjoy and then they're gonna go. And, and often what happened was once we took the angst that you could come, like you, it was like you can't come in, once we negate it, you couldn't come in, it became less fun to come in. You know, it became its own self-fulfilling thing. Sure, you can come in anytime you want. I don't care if you come in. So it's all on how you decide. But if you're gonna do a sleep plan, buy in seven hard days. She has four, but that's optimistic. <laughs> you wanna be proactive. I'm a proactive person. I'm always anticipating the problem, looking for solutions versus reacting, we've got a problem. It's gonna be hard for you to go to middle school. What are we gonna to do to make it easier? We're gonna to drive to the middle school. We're gonna walk around the middle school campus. Maybe we'll even go in the building. Maybe we'll get to know the principal. You know, all the things that desensitize. Procrastination is the way of avoiding that that's negative. So if you can determine the negative, then you can minimize the negative. What are you trying to avoid? Well, I hate doing, I hate writing. This is what our kids with LLD say all the time. Oh my God, I gotta write an essay. It's a whole page. I'm not writing a whole page. No, no, I'm definitely not writing a whole page. Okay, could you write a sentence? No, I don't, I don't want to write a sentence. How about a word? Oh, yeah, I'll write a word. Or maybe you could write a couple words. 
you're just getting them going, getting the system user friendly. Um, and the way I wrote my book was exactly how that started. I was never going to write a book, and then I was like, ah, I'll write one word, I'll write a chapter. Next thing we know, out and done. So where do you come in? Parents, sometimes we make the mistake we actually reinforce anxiety. Kid always likes to do the same thing, and you always do the same thing. So now the anxiety's got control. So you can change that by saying, hey, we're going to change it up. How can we change it up? You and I decide how we're going to do it a little different. That's one way. The other way is sometimes life interferes, and you don't know it's going to change, and the anxious kid gets really upset because, you know, you got stuck and you couldn't pick them up. Well, that's again saying, but life happens, right? So we've got to figure out how we're going to deal with it. You want to let them deal with their anxiety so they get stronger. You want them to face their fears. And you also want them to learn that failing isn't the worst thing in the world. You learn from failure. We've all failed. We've all gotten better. And so one of the things that really helps kids is to acknowledge what's there. Hey, look, I get it. It's really hard. I don't care. I don't want you to talk to me. Don't tell me it's hard. OK, I won't tell you it's hard. Do you really think it's hard? I do really think it's hard. Because silence in kids is intolerable. If you can be quiet, they will come back and talk. Except most of us can't be quiet. And we, had, <laughs> we have these very funny things that sometimes happen in our office. I had a mom in my office the other day, and I was like, you're going to have to sit on your hands so you can be quiet. And she was like, I can't sit on my hands. And I was like, we're going to have to sit on your hands or be quiet. Take your pick. Because she was so, and she was like, OK. And I said, just like for a minute. We're just, we're just going to go for a minute so he can. And it worked, but it was equally hard for her as it was for him. He was worried she was talking because she was so worried about him worrying. <laughs> and so that's the sort of silence is good. I like silence. You want to practice being brave. You want to practice in safe ways where there's success. Sometimes we role play. Sometimes I'm the kid. I love being the kid because you can act totally ridiculous. And they love it. They're like, what? so stupid, mom, why are you making me good? And they're like, do I sound that way? And you go, a little bit. So the role playing really switches, switches it up for them. You want to answer the questions, but you want to tell them they have the control. And then you want to help them calm down, which works for them. Some kids like to fiddle. Some kids like to walk. Some kids want to draw. Some kids want to sit in a quiet room and have nobody talk to them. We have one little guy who comes home from school and doesn't talk for two hours. He works very hard at school. And the mom was like, I'm dying to know what happened in school. And I was like, not for two hours. He's in his room, chilling out, playing with his Legos. And if everybody stays out of his room, he's a happy camper. Often the adults have a hard time, and then all hell breaks loose, because now he hasn't had time to decompress. So what your goal is to find what works for your family and for him. And together, you get a plan. And kids love this because they love when they're heard. And they also love when it works. So we're always looking to make them self-sufficient, but not too soon, right? So you, you don't want them to fail. So that's always the yin and the yang, how much, how little. Um, you want to let them make their own decisions with your guidance. So, you know, like my sort of standard line is, you wouldn't let a five-year-old decide where he's going to college, because that makes no sense. Just like we wouldn't let a 16-year-old drive without supervision, because we know that makes less sense, right? Because they're not going to be thinking about speed limits. So you have to titrate it. You want to start early to give them responsibility. You know, the, like I always say, two generations ago, everybody had to do chores. Chores are the best thing in the world. They really help kids learn the process. Even if it's a boring chore, like we have one kiddo who had to take everybody's trash out. It was very humorous. So we had to negotiate out. I don't want to take out the trash every day. They want him to take out the trash every day. I go, OK, what about twice a week? No, I don't want to do twice a week. Dad's like, I want it every day. He wanted the kid wanted it once a week. It was a silly battle, but it was clear there were a lot of other battles. So I was like, OK, Wednesday's my day. Everybody's, you're taking out the trash. You're not commenting Monday, Tuesday. Wednesday morning, if he doesn't have the trash out, you get to say something. And then everybody was fine. And then we just kept upping the responsibility. Because kids will fight with you over the silliest things. But the chores build self-esteem and responsibility. Cooking is a great thing for this. It's sequence. It's step by step. And at the end, you have a great product. 
right? You have something you can eat. So we do a lot with kids working with their parents, cooking dinner, being the sous chef. There's lots of creative ways you can do it, and we all know the Food Network has a thousand good recipes. Um, you want them to problem solve. Help me figure out what we're going to do. I'm like, I don't know. I'm not in your classroom. What are we going to do about that? Well, I hate to sit in the front. Well, can you sit in the back? No, I hate that more. I don't want to be in the middle. Where do you want to be? You know, and then, well, I'll be okay if I'm on the right or the left. You know, they have lots of things they're trying to work through. The key is not where they're sitting. Why do they want to sit in that place? Who are they trying to get away from? What is the, where is it that, for whatever reason, something is frustrating, flustering them? And that, you know, I always say to our patients, look, when things get tough, you get tougher. Dig your heels in. You put one foot in front of the other, and it'll get there. You don't give up. One foot in front of the other. Nobody said it was going to be easy. One foot in front of the other, and you will get there. And they're very funny because we follow kids from childhood, like from the time we first meet them, sometimes as early as two months to 18. We have long history with them, right? So we can say with a great deal of surety, remember this was hard, but now we're here. This was hard, now we're here. You have even more leverage because you're with them all every day, so you can talk about all the things they've accomplished. Options for treatment in ADHD, tons of ways to go, medication, Behavioral therapy, ABA, school interventions, parent interventions, and homeopathic. You find what works best for your family. Um, and integrated is best. So it's often not a one shoe fits all. You sometimes have to do school and medication. Sometimes you do nutritional changes. We had a little boy from Texas who was on four medications at the young age of seven, driving the entire family insane. He had a very rare disorder. And the mother called me. Parents were super smart, super invested. She said, what about if we took wheat and dairy out of his diet? <laughs> I was like, sure. I mean, like, why not? And she said, I don't know. It seems like he's worse on certain days. And we looked at the food. So yeah, I was like, take wheat out. Things got better. Took dairy out. Things got better. And then she called back about maybe a month or two later and said, I took sugar out. And I was like, what are you eating? And she was like, well, it's sort of plant-based. He's off all his meds. He's off every med. His behavior is 100 times better. Father happens to be a general surgeon. And as he said, nobody's going to have heart disease in my clan. He goes, I don't know what we eat sometimes, but it's OK. But it was the piece by piece that got us there. And it was striking how much he improved. Like everybody was blinded except me who saw him. And they were like, what med is he on? And I was like, none. So we like when we get those stories, whether it's med, adding a med, taking out a med. Um, you want to target daily skills because practice is your friend. So motor development is something you can do every day, right? That's something you can always work on. It can be basketball. It can be soccer. It can be seeing how fast you run. With little kids, we have them beat the microwave clock. We make them run around the house and see how fast they go. And then the next time they run again and to see if the time goes down. So they're, they're actually getting fit, they're having fun, and their time's improving. It's just a silly game. A lot of six, seven, and eight-year-olds absolutely love it because they want to move. So it here, this is less of an issue in the setting you're in, but for our public school kids, we talk about all the different pieces that have to be implemented to make sure that from start to finish you cover your work. And one of the things we give them great confidence in that because you have ADHD or anxiety or learning disability it does not preclude you being 100% successful. It's just an explanation for why you learn different. Lots of people with those issues are 100% successful. They have a career they love. They live in a, you know, they're doing great. They have family, they have friends, they have a community. So you want to encourage problem solving. This is the hardest thing, I think. Do not jump in and solve the problem. To sit back and let them go through the process. You want to help them during homework, but not do their homework. You want to develop routines. The more routines you have, the easier it is for your brain. Your brain does not like to have to think a lot. This is why you put your keys in the same place, because then you don't have to think about it. It's why you park your car in the same place, and when you go to the mall and you park in a different place, you have the same response, like, where did I park my car? Oh, it's usually. The brain is gravitating to routines. So kids benefit from routines. 
and you want rules that are clear and crisp at home, you're going to be kind. You're going to be respectful. There's going to be no hitting. Whatever they are, no more than four, and somewhere easily accessible. So when somebody's acting out, you're like, respectful, right here. And you know, the idea is there's a little bit of humor to it. You're not even talking. You're like, ah, and you let them go. Because the idea is you're bringing them back from here to here. And then when we see combined phenotypes, we talk about anxiety plus ADHD. It's very common, or ADHD and learning problems. Many, many kids have more than one. We need to look at the combination to determine the best treatment, but we also have to see which one is the most interfering. Okay, that's gonna be really important. Which one complicates your life? If he's not turning in his homework because of the ADHD, that's much more complicating than the fact that it's taking you two hours to get the homework done. So you really have to tackle what is most intrusive and back down from there. And then with ADHD, I can't say to you enough, planning is coming online slow but steady. It takes a very long time for working memory and inhibition to gel. And so your degree of surveillance is important. Your degree of support is important. It will get there, but it does take long. And people talk about it all the time when their kids are in their mid-20s. Like, can you believe? I can't believe that, like, that's the same kid. Remember that kid I couldn't get out of bed in sixth grade? So it does happen, but it's very slow. Um, you want to first treat the disorder that causes the most challenge because this is what's interesting. Sometimes you will pull out one piece and five other things will fall with it and settle down. So you treat the anxiety and suddenly the irritability goes away, the oppositional goes away, and the homework gets done. Okay, because they were anxious about failing in the homework. So that's why I pick the primary problem and there's lots of healthcare providers that can help with that. So just to give you a quick idea of genetic disorders that are hiding in plain sight. Do any of these kids look different to you? We have the one little guy, well, he's not little. He's six foot four, I'm five four, looking like I'm standing in a hole. Um, all of these kids have an extra X. This is the most common explanation for a learning disorder. It is one in 1,000 children, if you count girls with extra X's and boys with extra X's. Boys with extra X's actually occur one in 450 to 500. Seventy-five percent of these kids will go undiagnosed. They are not obvious, they are not distinguishable, but they all have learning disabilities. They have increased incidence of ADHD, anxiety, executive dysfunction, language-based learning disorders. These are the three disorders, 47, we all have 46 chromosomes. These guys have an extra X, an extra Y, or the girls have an extra X. Why is it important to find these out? It's a simple cheek swab because their treatment is different based on the disorders. The boys have differences in brain development, so specific parts of their brain are smaller and bigger. They, it affects their learning at every age, and their behavior changes depending on their age. Higher incidence of anxiety, they can be yelling and crying simultaneously, which is often uncommon in older kids. We're talking about teenage kids. They could be throwing, running, and fighting. So they're often kids that are caught up in behavioral issues. We know that girls tend to cry and boys tend to hit, but we also have boys that do a combination of both. The other thing is there are three what we call copy number variants that are very common in learning differences. Chromosome 16 on the arm, which is the P arm, chromosome 4 on the P arm, and then 7Q, which is, these are all duplication, so you have additional material. These are all important to identify because there are other problems that are associated with it that you would want to know and take care of. How do you identify it? It's very easy. You get a cheek swab. It's safe, it's reliable, your pediatrician can order it. The American College of Medical Genetics suggests any child with developmental differences should have this. They then, that cheek swab gets analyzed. We look at the, how much, too much, too little on every chromosome. And then if there's an answer, about 40% of the time there's an answer, then the treatment changes. In our particular center, it's about 60% of the time. 
Of course, everybody's coming to us with some kind of developmental difference. The other thing that you may not be aware of that's also really helpful is something called pharmacogenetics. You can take a cheek swab now and it can identify three categories of drug effects. So it can tell you the drugs that are safe, they're cautious to use, or the no-goes, those to avoid. This is very valuable if you're thinking about putting your child on medication. So it saves you a lot of time. We do it often with pediatricians um, to say like, I want to put them on anti-anxiety and you do the cheek swab and you find out that all the SSRIs are not indicated. So that takes out Wellbutrin and a bunch of others. Yes? The question is related to pharmacogenetics and whether the cheek swab is an effective way to determine um, what medications and what ages are appropriate. So it is a new field, but because it's a new field doesn't necessarily mean it can't provide answers at this point. I think there's a lot of controversy. We've had good results with it. Um, it's, not, it's not the be end end all, but nothing is, right? And so it's just another tool in your toolbox to help you try to figure out. In some children, it's been enormously valuable because you know, the list of everything we would have used is in the no-go line, and we're like, wow, that really makes it easier. But from my standpoint, what we say to families is something to think about because it can save you time. Doesn't mean you're necessarily going to do it. Um, and it will get better because everything gets better in genetics over time. Um, speaking about the privacy with CMA and pharmacogenetics, so they're not sharing. No, they can't because it's a lab, right? So they're under CLIA laws. So they can't share the information. Um, the child is, the system is protected from the standpoint of the information going in. Of course, honestly speaking, nothing's really protected because anything can be hacked. So it's sort of the yin and the yang of that. But they're not able to sell it because that would be breaching the CLIA laws. Um, as far as the pharmacogenetics, um, the same thing applies because it's a laboratory. You have to be certified to do it. And so it's all protected. The question that often comes up is related to um, what if your insurance company finds out and then won't do something because you have this. That is ongoing debate, as we all know, pre-existing conditions. But in reality, not knowing can be just as costly as knowing. And so you just have to do what you're most comfortable with. We've never had problems with either test. Pharmacogenetics has only been around in the last maybe 18 months. Um, cheek swab's been under, you know, it was developed by David Ledbetter um, probably 10 years ago, maybe 12. So it's been around for a while. It's just, it used to be blood, now it's a cheek swab. For us, the cheek swab is really helpful because we have little kids and we don't want to draw blood. Um, but I do think it's something to think about and information is helpful. And then, so when we think about the wrapping this up, what I think is most important is, if you can find a diagnosis on your child, it may change treatment. It may actually improve treatment. It may give you information that's helpful in the future. So we have a baby autism study we're doing at our center where we're identifying babies at risk by nine months of age. We identified a little guy. He was in the language impaired group, not the autistic group. We did a cheek swab on him. He had a deletion. The deletion said seizures were at risk. The mother called us maybe six months later and said, you know, he sort of is doing something funny. And I said, what? And she said, not staring off, but like sort of not there. And I was like, OK, take him to your pediatrician and take, we, you know, we're going to send you the information. He needs an EEG. So literally, practically asymptomatically, we picked up the seizure disorder. So if he hadn't had the at risk, we probably would have the pediatrician would have been reasonable to say, let's watch it. You know, let's give it a week or two. But because of what the deletion showed and what the risk status was, he was more inclined to go looking. And that's always a good thing to rule in or rule out. So that's one of the advantages. It's much more personalized treatment because you have a community you're now in. We can follow that literature. We write papers about those kids. So we're adding to the literature, which then people counter with further information. And then most important, it gives us the ability to have a greater degree of 
um, understanding of potentially where we're going to go, and that's very valuable. And then last and probably most important is our job together collectively is to encourage your children to know that working hard, being patient, and doing it again and again until you get it right will pay off in the long run because life is about practice and we all revisit the same cycle. Often it doesn't seem that way, but when you look back at what you did at your 20s and your 30s, there's a lot of similarities of going forward two steps, one back, forward again. So we want the kids to know that life is long and positive and that they have great potential because the world changes every day and who knows what's gonna be on the next horizon as far as treatment and care. So internal motivation is always hard because typically what the kids really, the child's really worried about is not being successful, right? You know, I'm not going to do this because I have failed so many times. I'm afraid of trying that. So one of the things is building the rapport of, do you need a partner to do it with? Can, how can we identify what's most onerous, most scary? Um, because most kids want to be successful internally. What keeps them from being successful is fear or anxiety. So the more you address it, the better you can at peeling back the onion. Are you worried about this? Are you worried about that? The other thing is, you know, every kiddo has a goal that he wants on something that's self-serving. So in the sense of what's important to him. We had a little boy in middle school, or we wanted him to run because he was really wild. We wanted more energy. Mom couldn't get him to do anything. She called me and she was like, he was an eighth grader, so older. He was already, he's taller than me, five, six. He's gonna be about six, five. She said, I want him to run because I want him tired. And I was like, no, that's a good idea. And she said, he's refusing. And I was like, what's he want? And she goes, what do you mean? And I go, well, think about it from a bribe standpoint. What's really valuable? And she said, money. And I go, I'm okay with money. He's third in his track team. He got $100 to run track for four months. I was like, it's cheap. Um, and she was really funny because she was like, everybody in the house is happier. You know, he had three sisters, so some of it was not his fault. But um, the idea being you have to find the sweet spot of what is going to be motivating enough and rewarding enough from your perspective, and it changes all the time. So for 16-year-olds, taking the car away is like death. Right? So the car becomes hugely valuable. You know, you can have this, there's lots of things. And you're not taking away the self-initiative, you are just promoting it with the idea that you're gonna fade it. Because the goal is always to get them to work for the intent of being successful, but sometimes you're stuck and you can't. So, and we, we always can find something with kids. Sometimes it's very tricky, but we have never ever not found a child that we can't motivate. Um, sometimes that is, from the parental standpoint, challenging. We had a 19-year-old in just recently, he and his mother were really sort of at it, and she, they were both legitimately annoyed with each other. And so we structured sort of what we could get that she would give on and what he would give on. And he was very good. He, like she said, I will agree, I have been the bad child. She was very funny when she came in. And I was like, what does that mean? And he said, they were both there together. He's like, I did everything that was on your check sheet. He's like, not so much, mom. So then that became really important. So I said, so you see what happens here? Like he's being really good. You're being a little non-compliant is the message. Non-compliant pays off. It was really a battle over who was going to cook in the kitchen. It was a really funny story. And so she said, okay, I'll, I'll admit I'm insane about the kitchen. I'm like, okay. So now we got to figure out another way because he wanted to learn how to cook. That was sort of his theory. He had a lot of allergies. So my point being, you can, you can motivate anybody, but you will often have to take many, many layers back before you got it. He wants to move out. That's his end product. She wants him to be safe when he moves out because of the allergies. So together they are learning how to share and to cooperate because it's hard for both of them. She wants to prepare all his meals. You can understand why he's got a super anaphylactic reaction. He wants, of course, to cook whatever he wants. She can't cook for the rest of his life. So somehow they're gonna, they're doing the dance. It's actually working well. And she said she was a bad child this time, but maybe next time she'll be, they'll both be good children.
So that's a great question about like sort of the bell curve of humanity and where do copy number deletions come in. We all have what we call bad genes or recessive genes. We just don't always necessarily know what they are and we typically say eight to 10. I don't think we all have copy number variants, but we don't know that, so we could. Um, what we're now defining is what does the phenotype look like? So what does it look like if your 16P is a duplication, there's extra material? And that will take us, you know, give or take a good 10 years before we'll really be able to tease it back and have enough to know. Do we all have anxiety? Without a doubt. Are we all a little inattentive? inattentive? Sure. You know, just think about how you are if you're worried about at work. Your boss has been picking on you all day and yelling at you. What do you get? You get a little frenetic, you start dropping things, you can't remember what you were doing. That's all. But as an adult, you can override that and say, I'm going to go out for a walk. Or I'm going to close my door and think for a second. I mean, you have, as a kid, you don't have those strategies, and that's the dilemma. And teenagers are global. They're all or nothing. It's a great life. I'm so happy. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I hate my life, and I'd like to die tomorrow. I mean, you know, they're very swing, and that's part of being an adolescent. That's the hard part. So the question is, are we identifying them, and they would have been OK with or without them? So that's a really reasonable question to ask and a difficult one to answer. So for some of our disorders, the mothers actually have a very characteristic behavior. And they come in, and they've gone to college, a lot of them, but they're anxious. And they're sort of like, you know, they're like road runners. That, you know, they're just chaotic. When you talk to their pediatricians, they're like, oh, I can't ever get that mother under control. So you're like, hmm, a little bit more than normal. Then you do a copy, you know, do a cheek swab on the child. He has a deletion. This actually happened in our office. He has a duplication on a particular chromosome. Say to the mom, we should do you and your husband, figure out which one. Could you guess who had it? The mom. So her behavior was within normal, but still skewed to the left of where we'd like it. Her little guy, one guy was more skewed to the left than the other. So he was a bigger hit, so to speak. We expected him to be that. So I don't think we all have copy number variants, but I think they're going to be more common than anybody in genetics ever expected, because they're everywhere now. Other questions? All right, I thank you for your time. You've stayed a long time. <laughs>